I'm super excited to have Drew here today because this subject matters that we're going to be discussing and that he speaks on excite me so much. Like, time out. Like, we're going to be talking about levitation, which is achieved through quantum Zeno effect. Like, when you go into the Samadhi or tra like trance wisdom. And, um, when you do that, it means like you have no left brain thoughts and it and it, it's constantly emptying out the frequency of energy, like reversing the phase. And wait, uh, flying monks? Like, time, that's stupid. Like, I'm so excited. And then um, psychic vampires. That's great. I hope we get to that. And then poltergeist and levitation. That super excites me. And in honor that you're here, I'm going to wear these glasses. So we're kind of on the same, <laughs> same you know, and this is a, a, an ode to you. So um, they look great on you. Oh, thank you. Um, do you know there's time? This is a confession. It's kind of embarrassing, but I might as well share it because people and my, my loved ones have made fun of me for it. I have lenses. <laughs> I, have, oh. I have glasses that wow. don't have any. Like these ones have like a slight one in it, but I have glasses and would wear them for years that don't have, that are just clear lenses That's and like to be taken more seriously when I talk. <laughs> well, hey, why not? Like just for the look of it, like I, I, for several reasons, but yeah, they made fun of me for that, but that's a little um, vulnerable confession. So, um, People Another thing, I don't know if we're going to get into the quantum reality with the negative mass particles, but if we do, that's also something we're going to be talking about it. But um, I'm very excited to talk about this stuff. And uh, yes, I'm 
giving you the stage, Drew. Everyone, this is Drew. He's amazing. Yeah, I um, I was with you on a burning show, right? Like what a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So, um, actually, we did a show a year ago. There was a whole bunch of people in that show. It was like last, I think it was oh, like in January or February. Okay. But you know what? I might have, um, yeah, that was a long time ago. I might have bounced out right before your presentation or whatever, but technically oh. we're on the same show. Okay. Cool. Um, so, um, do you want me to show oh, this yeah, sure. meditation video? Okay. I'll just show this little excerpt first. So that's a fluorescent bulb, fluorescent light bulb, for those of you who remember, it still exists. And then that's paper, that's paper attaching the bulb. And this is called, called hard Qigong. So they're like martial artists, but they do Qigong. You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Whoa. No. Don't try this at home, kids. <laughs> okay. And they got the nice relaxing music. I don't hear any music, but that's okay. Oh, you don't hear it? No, it's okay. It's totally fine. Who knows with copyright, too? There you go. Okay. Um, let me show that other one real quick. Can you see this? Yes. Like, <laughs> you think uh, CrossFit is uh, next level. <laughs> Wait till you try this workout. Burger <laughs> egg? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, that's all. Uh, oops. You want me to remove that? Remove the... Or do you have another one? No, that's it. Okay. That's all for now that I can think of. So, um, so basically, the Western science up until recently did not have a ex explanation for levitation. But I, when I did my little debate with Jack Sarfati on uh, alien scientists. <laughs> I well, love that. When I hear every time I hear Jack Sarfati, I hear his voice going, "So what? So what?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. And um, but he did. He did really appreciate the quote I provided him. We had to quick look up the paper. That's like the first thing we did that got his attention. And it's a recent experiment called a weak measurement where they use it entangled photons. And the paper says that it proves there's a new re repulsively a gravitationally repulsive force, um, which is another way of saying anti-gravity. So they've proven that anti-gravity is a new novel force at the foundation of reality. And um, this is, I've been corresponding with uh, Basil J. Hiley. He, he, he collaborated with David Bohm, who was famous for um, discussing with Einstein quantum physics in like the 50s, but then Bohm came up with a a new 
uh, explanation of reality that's it's quantum physics but it has doesn't have any of the statistics mumble jumble stuff and so he can at the bohmian model it actually can show the these trajectories that are they're called like sub quantum so they exist before the particle exists and they actually will they're they're non-local and so what he's saying this anti-gravity force is inherently non-local which means that it's before a particle exists so it's like holographic so like it's everything's interwoven and the future and the past are also interwoven so that's where that's kind of the secret of levitation and that's why it's hard for people to believe but my own uh qigong master teacher he was he works at the mayo clinic he's been in minnesota for like 30 years now Uh uh-huh but when he finished his uh full lotus cave meditation at uh, mount ching chung he went 28 days non-stop in full lotus meditation with no sleep and no sleep 28 days no nothing yeah, no food. Just, in, in, in full lo- most people can't sit in full lotus for you know ten minutes, much less twenty eight days nonstop. Um, so, but then when he got out, he said he levitated up nine feet and he spiraled up um, next to a pine tree. You know, he was in full lotus meditation. He levitated. Wait, up. on the twenty eighth day? Well, it was. There was no. It was. Well, I. You know, let's see. Was it the twenty? I don't know if it was the twenty eighth day. Good question, but. He was in the cave for 28 days. So then he got out of the cave using full lotus meditation. So uh-huh. I don't know if that, that was the next day or the same day. <laughs> of the t- Are you talking like the calendar, like the lunar calendar? Is that what you're getting at? Or- what did you say? Is that why you asked it if, if it was the 28th day? Like, I don't know. If Anyway. Um, no, yeah, if you so- find out, let me know. I totally want to know. Oh, well, because of the lunar calendar? Is that what you For a lot of reasons. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um... Anyway, this is so like I believe him because I've I've experienced his energy and I've done enough training myself where I experienced a strong um, space time uh, vortex when I when I did deep meditation and fasting. And and what most people think, well, if you're fasting, you're going to get weaker. Um, One of the one of the ironies of this quantum, what they call it, the quantum potential in the Bohmian physics Mm -hmm. is that the the amplitude in as far as the map in the far as the mathematics it's a new type of energy where the amplitude is in the denominator and then the quantum potential is in the numerator so you can have a really weak amplitude of energy but the quantum potential can be very strong and what the quantum potential is it's not local so if you think of it as like a radio frequency field that's like guiding a airplane or whatever mm-hmm. um it's basically like it explains the double slit experiment. So, like, if you have like one particle going through and they can't figure out why it's making a wave, like if you keep sending more and more single particles, it creates a wave pattern on the other side, and they don't know why. And, mm. and so, what they've proven that the the at this at the level of the smallest matter, like the electron, there is a non-local information energy field that is guiding. The particle so it knows whether there's two slits open or one slit open so does this support a lot of like simulation theory people no it does not because the simulation theory is based on like a digital concept of reality but the mm-hmm. quantum the quantum logic it's not digital at all it's rather the the non-locality means that you have an, an, a constant overlapping of you know what they call quantum quantum logic is like a cute the qubit essentially it would be like they they call it like neither this nor not that so it's like a like a double like a double negative that reminds me with time that reminds me of phil yeah, hartman very- when he did a sketch on saturday night live and he pretended like he hit the character was this acting coach that is was a really famous acting coach that works yeah. with all these celebrities and his That's method awesome. was he would go like this this is something this is nothing. This is something. This is nothing. This yeah, is yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. This is nothing. So yeah. what you just said, I was like, this is something. This is nothing. Like, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, it's it gets really abstract really fast. But it, but the irony is, is that all this stuff actually comes from music theory. And um, and uh, it but but what happened is because science is actually based on music theory, the math, the mathematics of science. And it turns out that they're using the wrong music theory when they created modern science ever since plato like all the science will say well it's from you know so like i 
I, I feel like the stars. stars are sounds. I feel like the stars emit a sound and like it, the information in those sound frequencies is emitted. And then it looks like a record player to the way when you see the way that the star, what is you, what? No, I, you I'm listening. I, I mean, it's yeah. The actually the, like the, okay. Well, see the, as Westerners, we're really, really visual. So it's hard for us to, to, get the idea that we cannot see time, you know? And so, it, but in meditation, you can listen to time at a, at a faster than light speed, at a super luminous speed. And so um, it's something very, very simple, but it's something that Westerners, they can't grasp because they're, because we're so stuck in a visual framework. So like, you know, in Western science, we define time as a spatial measurement. But if you like music, you don't even need a musical instrument you know, for music. You can just sing or whatever. And that's what most cultures do. So the originally, you know, humans were like 200,000 years old. So we, so anyway, that's like, if you, if you understand the truth of music, there's only one guy who understood, who understands the secret of music. And he has a Fields Medal in mathematics and that's harder to get than the nobel prize the fields medal most people never heard of a fields medal but um and he uh follow the fields medal <laughs> yeah he's the only one who's figured out the secret of music theory but it's called non-commutativity that's what it's called in science and that's what basil j highly figured out also he said that this that the bolmian physics of this future and the past overlapping it's a process so it's a eternal flowing as energy information so it's kind of like that metaphor like you can't step in the same river twice that kind of thing like it's always everything's always changing like in normal science we want to have off-the-shelf technology we want something to be repeatable but what this is saying is reality is always new all the time it's ever new and that's proven in quantum physics they call it the non-cloning theorem where you cannot repeat the same experiment twice but um what this shows is that like in part of my debate with Jack Sofati, he's like, oh, non commutativity that's just the uncertainty principle. But Basil J. Hiley is very adamant, no, it is not the uncertainty principle. There's something deeper to non commutativity And it's what it, and basically, it just basically means the future and the past are overlapping. So in music, it's just like undertones, the undertones and overtones are going on at the same time. And when you listen to the source of sound, you can have this infinite resonance and you cannot see it. And so, but it's guiding you, it's guiding you from the future. And it's this energy information and, and that energy information is also the secret of life. And it's also anti-gravity. So when you go deeper into it through meditation, what like, um, there's, I mentioned to you in the email sent this, there's this, the most famous Buddhist monk of Thailand. His oh, name's, I love this. His name's Fra. Archung Mun, and he has a biography online. Anybody can read it. Well, I read it through interlibrary loan when I was finishing my master's degree. I, I read like, I don't know, like 50 books on meditation and non-Western philosophy. And I read, and he's, he was with his meditation buddy and his meditation buddy started levitating, right? Mm -hmm. and this is in Thailand. But as soon as the guy realized he was levitating, he fell back down, right? So then he realized, well, in order to stay levitating, you have to stay in what they call samadhi in meditation. And basically, it's like a visualization, but you're constantly emptying out what you're visualizing. And so in science, this is what they call the quantum Zeno effect, where you can prevent the collapse of the wave function, you can maintain the non locality and the quantum coherence. So if you have the, the non locality is at a certain time rate, so it'd be like a millisecond the non-locality is like a millisecond um, entanglement. And then, but if you keep maintaining a measurement at like a microsecond, that's actually like at an ultrasound frequency. Mm -hmm. And so if you, you prevent the collapse of the wave function, and it's basically like you're freezing time, like the quantum Zeno effect. Now, that, so that's what Samadhi actually is, is that because you're maintaining the quantum coherence, it turns out that the there's a secret um, relativistic mass of light. So when you, well, like each of us has biophotons, it goes out of our eyes when our eyes are open. We don't realize it because it's super 
super weak. But when we meditate, we build up that light energy. And um, they recently did uh, did a, a anti-gravity demonstration on that alien scientist show where they had a light, uh, a little laser on a um, piece of graphene, a little bit of graphene. I don't know if you saw that, but it was... Who did it? Did Jeremiah do it? Who presented um, it? No, it wasn't Jeremiah. It was... I can't remember the guy's name, but they... It's... But this is... I looked it up because that's what I do when they have a show. I quick look everything up and I use um, Google Scholar and I use all the academic stuff on the, online. And um, it's a pretty common experiment now where they're they call it, you know, quantum levitation. And and the reason it works is because because graphene graphene is um it has a one half spin in the because you have a like two hexagons. The the two hexagons are slightly overlapping, so you get the you get an extra electron overlapping with each other that they're entangled, they're non local through this what they call the one half spin. Normally you cannot measure one half spin inherently. So there's this thing called the Dirac dance. And I learned this my first year of college, but essentially this is this is non-locality where you know you have this you have that turn around. Like if you're holding a, a cup or something and you can't spill it, like you can't spill this cup, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to you have to turn it around like that. Like that. Now it's well I'm looking in the camera, but so each each zero point of um each zero point of space time has that going on the future and the past, like it's hard for us to imagine time being asymmetric because that, that how can you, if you can't visualize time, how can it be asymmetric? But if you think of, um, well, I it, feel like it, a lot of people are like, wait, how do I do this? Like, just, and just feel like, Oh, I'm never going to be able to levitate and never really, you know, practice <laughs> in their practice and their journey. Well, that brings us to the poltergeist thing. That, <gasps> it, Yay. It, we made it to the poltergeist. <laughs> I love it. I'm so excited. Well, because um, I was reading this, there's this Taoist Qigong master that we showed his video with uh, Bernie, the uh, John Chang, and he's like the most famous, it's the most famous Qigong master video. Is he the one that they made, uh, China made a national treasure? Um, that's Yan Shin. And okay. he's, yeah, we could, we could talk about him too, but um, he, there's probably some levitation story about him too. But anyway, um, uh, John Chang, he, uh, yeah, he he demonstrated levitation. Actually, now that I think of oh, what was I even talk about now, but but um oh the, 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 the poltergeist yeah. stuff yeah the the, poltergeist he, <laughs> he, he explained poltergeist also, but but he yeah in, there's a book about him called the Magus of Java because that's where he lives in Java, and um and he he was with the what the West a Westerner wrote the book right he demonstrated levitation to this Westerner so actually you know he learned that pretty early on but he meditates all the time right so he's but um, he said that it would have been easier for him to do if there had not been synthetic carpet. I mean, he in the book they talk about you know he levitated up eight eight inches off the carpet, and he was in full lotus meditation. And but he's like, if there had if there hadn't been any carpet, it would have been easier. No, so that what that means is that that's the yin chi because the the earth the Schumann resonance is the negative ions as yin chi what they call yin chi. So when he's saying that the synthetic carpet made it harder for him to levitate. That means he was relying on the the yin chi. Um, now there's okay. There's there's another aspect that's like one hint to levitation. Another thing is that um, with the poltergeist, he's explaining that well, ghosts ghosts actually are based on yin chi. Like that's like when a normal person dies, they their ghost will just be living off yin chi because we each have. Yeah, wait. I thought. Wait, really quick. I had a thought about that when we were talking about this before, where I was like. What if like um, that? That's a way to do it. But also, like, what if you you connect with your higher self and are in alignment with that guidance, where it is kind of, do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No. There's, um, no <laughs> Sometimes I, I think something and then conveying what I'm, what well, I thought or speaking, it doesn't come out right. Um. There's, okay. That's that's all right too. Like that's that would that gets more into the frequency of the spirit inside you. Um, which can also be based on yin chi also, but, um, no, I just, I've, I had like a experience and I'll yeah. talk about it one day where I literally, um, I, I saw me, it was like a holographic version of me mm -hmm. and she made me feel stupid. She was really powerful and she was very telepathic. And I remember thinking like it was a future version of me 
And um, she looks the way I do now, or at the time, this was like 2020, 2021. And uh, I was, I remember thinking like, God, what do I end up doing? Like, I couldn't figure out if it was something really bad or something really good because she was so powerful and she intimidated me and she made me feel stupid. But the fact that it was me, like, it was like a future version of me with the way I looked then and within like a five year span. And I was like, oh, wow. So I'm so I'm imagining like, OK, well, we're talking about uh, if they were to, um, you know, like poltergeist and levitation. What if there's a way to do that with a version of yourself? You, get, you know what I'm saying? Like, channel, yeah. you know, a version of yourself. Well, okay. Can you say that again? Because it was like robot, oh, robotic. I said it was like poltergeist climbed into your mic and started speaking. <laughs> I because my had my hand over my face probably. Um, yeah, the uh, another version of you. Well, and like the when you have a really deep the the yang shen, which is creating another immortal body, that does look like you because it's based on your yin chi and your yang chi in your body. So that's why it will look just like you, you know, when it when you create a um, a yang shen, which is a golden. That's good to hear because there's people that would say, um, no, well, you know, there's these beings out there and aliens that are able to disguise themselves and appear how whoever they want to appear like. It could, you know, it's probably them appearing to you as you, but it did not feel like that. It was a, okay. a totally different feeling. Yeah, I mean. I mean, you could flip it around to where it's like, yeah, how much, you know, I mean. I'm sorry, to, I don't want to derail I, you. I'll let you go back to the poltergeist <laughs> and uh, yeah. levitation. I just have to throw it out, throw well, it out there. Well, the, the whole concept of non-locality is essentially what in non-Western philosophy they call non-dualism, which is essentially there's a level of reality that's neither inside nor outside, and it has no size. So it's basically pure time and you can't see it, but it's an energy information, and it's also precognitive, so it's guiding us from the future. So it's not any individual spirit. It's not a spirit, it's not a person, it's not you know, an alien, it's nothing like that. It's not an astral realm. It's truth of reality, but it's it's non-local. And they, they've proven this in physics. And, that, and Basil J. Hiley's big point is that almost all physicists cannot handle non-locality. They cannot accept it. Now, even though why because they can't touch it, taste it, prove it, or like constantly access it. Well, good question. Actually, uh, Tim Modlin, he's another guy I mentioned in my my chat with Jack Sarfati. Uh, he's and Tim goes or Jack goes. Yeah, I know what Tim Modlin is because he's a NYU. Yeah, <laughs> I got a. I, got I love his spirit, though, man. <laughs> I love it. And um, but he. But anyway, he, uh, Tim Mullen, he's an NYU professor uh, of physics, philosophy of physics, and he, um, he just did a talk on YouTube about the Bell's inequality theorem, which got the Nobel Prize in uh, 2022, I think it was, and, um, and it's all about non-locality. So he, hmm. if, you, if you look that talk up, it's on some math channel or something, but it was a few weeks ago, and... Um, Maybe it was a couple weeks ago. And anyway, he but he's he gives a great talk and he's essentially just pounding home the fact that um it, he host he hosted another uh philosopher of uh, a physics professor from France who I've corresponded with um to New York and that guy sent me his lecture at from NYU and he, and that, that guy's big point is even Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking did not understand um Bell's inequality hmm. as non locality. So this the big point is that this is something, you know, like Bas Basil J. Halley is pointing out that Richard Feynman, Richard Feynman's wrong, you know, Dirac is wrong, Einstein is wrong. He has a great quote from Einstein where at the end of Einstein's life he says, um, actually, that the truth of reality is non commutativity and that the space time continuum has to be dismantled. You know, that's Einstein. He, at, the, at the end of his life, he realized that there, in order to you know, if you're going to unify quantum physics with relativity, there's something deeper going on, and it gets into consciousness. What, what not, what not what we normally think of as consciousness, but what Roger Penrose calls proto-consciousness, being inherently, inherently precognitive, 
Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, I'm um, like, that's just the look on my face, Drew. Uh, <laughs> I look like I'm not <laughs> hearing you. No, I'm totally getting, I'm, I totally hear you loud and clear. We got you. Okay. So, now just to bring it back to levitation, the, the thing is, okay, there's this great, the, there's this great book that called The Man Who Could Fly by Professor Michael Grosso. And it's about Joseph de Cappertino, who was a saint in the um, 1600s. Mm, and, I love this. I love this info. Yeah, he was, um, Michael Grosso was in Italy, um, and he discovered Joseph de Cappertino in, in a bookstore. It was like in Italian, you know. And the thing is, is that there's over, there's like 95 some testimonials about, about witnessing Joseph levitating. And, but there's, I think there's 150 testimonials. They're all through the church. So it's like, you know, high level, you know, whatever priests and some popes and all that. But they're, I don't know, maybe just one pope. But anyway, um, but they, but most of them are all against him because, you know, this is a, you don't want, you don't want your, a monk, you know, flying around the church. Like they tried to keep him hidden, you know, but see that, so he's the most well documented levitation case. And the thing is, is he was, he worshiped mother, the mother of God. He worshiped the mother, Mother Mary or whatever. And he would, when he levitated, he would have the, first he would have the greatest ecstasy he ever experienced, mm. the greatest joy. When he felt the greatest joy, that's when he would start levitating. And so it's, the other fascinating thing about um, him is that people would see his clothes would not move, even though he was moving really fast, like sometimes when he levitated. Really? Dart around really fast, but his clothes would not move. And so, and what's difficult for people to realize is that you can actually create a space-time bubble around you. You can create a space-time vortex. And Basil J. Hiley even says this. He says that the the non-local, this non-local force that's anti-gravity, it actually, um, the only closest thing to it is the idea of a vortice, a vortices, creating a vortice where you have different speed of flow, like with the airplane, how an airplane flies, is that you create a third force from having a fast speed um, over the top and a slow speed, you know. So, and he also said that you find this in relativity in um and in your human body, and in your heart stream, and in your cerebral spinal fluid stream, the three, <laughs> the two around a third. Yeah, that's where it's at. Yeah, so I actually experienced this space-time vortex, and I, it so freaked me out, So because it wasn't normal dizziness. It was like the room was spinning around me, but it wasn't me being dizzy. It was literally a space-time vortex, and that's what... That's why I stopped meditating. My energy channels closed up, you know, after that. Really? There was times where I would, uh, or I'm in a deep meditation, like trance meditation. And uh, but it was a show. It was also showing me things, too, where everything, it was like an earthquake. Like everything okay. shakes. Have you ever experienced that? Like it um, was like trembling. But I. But it was also showing me certain planetary um It would show me planets at very particular locations, which... Hold on here. Like, can we talk about how difficult that is to be shown planets <laughs> in a specific spot? And then you need to write that down afterwards. And I did. But, like, having to remember, like, okay, Mars is at 1 o'clock <laughs> being shown. But anyways, like, when it was showing me that and this incoming of, like, a comet or an asteroid, there was uh, everything shook. Everything trembled. Where I, And that's happened, like, two or three times where that's, hap that's occurred. And um, where I was like, but the first time was so like, wow, wow, is this happening? You know, like, like your vision and you're feeling it like it's really occurring. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, Jim, the, there's the teaching assistant of Chun Yu Lin, um, the Chinese Qigong master I, I took classes from. The, his teaching assistant's name, Jim Nance, and he became a Qigong master. He told me the story where um, he was meditating in a church with Chun Yu Lin. It was Chun Yulin, Jim, and another guy. The three of them meditated. Like together? Take three yeah, of them meditating were, together? Yeah, just the three of them, they were meditating. It's probably like, I don't know why they were there. Maybe it was after a talk or a class. And really quick, Jim, he used to play professional basketball? Yeah, he did play professional Rad. basketball okay. in, in Turkey. And That's he cool. also was a Kung Fu master in the 1960s. He was like African American Kung Fu master. Um, so he, but he said that the, um, they, uh, Chen Yi was like, oh, the, the blue light, the blue light's really strong. He could see the, and, and, and Jim could not see the blue light and neither could the other guy because they weren't like advanced enough yet in their meditation at that point. And then the uh, church, 
the church walls started to crack, and so they had to stop meditating. Like the wow. Power, power got so strong, the church, the church started to crack. Whew. So well, I, that, can, uh, I can, what you're talking about, you know, I can, I can see something like that happening, you know. Um, also, another another story. Like the house like, wasn't shaking, but everything, like <laughs> my body, it was you're like it percent. was, but uh, I was. And that's another thing is when I saw that version of myself, uh, it was holographic. It was yeah. the way I, the, when I wrote it down afterwards, because it was so profound, I described it as the light from Venus. I was like, you know how you look at Venus and the light beneath Venus that is blue? It was like, it was a blue, it was like, imagine a holographic version that's in that, like, a, a, kind of like a royal, like, electric blue. And so, anytime I've said that to people, or like, I was like, yeah, no, you know the the color that Venus glows beneath it? And they're like, no, I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. And there's been times where I've been, like, pointed to Venus, like, you see the blue underneath? And they're like, no, Julia, it's not blue. Well, but, actually, um... <laughs> Like sun sun gazing is a real thing worth um I mean I know there's there was a documentary made about it where you know I mean, the guy's like he went to a doctor and like, Well your your eyes are damaged because he was sun gazing and all that. But for He said it was own, damaged from sun gazing? Yeah, he went because there was a guy testing it out. He made a documentary about himself practicing sun gazing and then he uh -huh. went to, to an eye doctor and they're like, No, don't do it, you know. But um but from my own experience, um when I, when I, if you look at the sun, you only want to do it when it's low on the horizon, you know, in the sun. Mm. But when I close my eyes, I see this beautiful blue light and green light. Like I see, you know, I don't just see, it's not most people, they would just get like that retina flash, you know, where you open your eyes and you see like light, you know, from your retina getting too much light. But this is from the third eye, the middle of the. Interesting. Take an energy. Have you heard about these people? Let's see. There's a name for it. Does anyone in the chat know? It's uh, when they'll be out at sea and they'll see the green flash. It's like a pirate thing, like a oh. like a people of the sea talk about this. Um, of where they'll look by the, <laughs> it'll be on the horizon, kind of by the sun, and they'll see the green flash, and it's like a oh, big the dog, deal. dogs, dog something, dog, dogs. I think it's called dog rays. Is that it? No, I was, I, I don't know. something like that. I thought I heard, but yeah, it's so. I mean, like I don't know. Chenny, Chenny, he ta he's talked about. You know, he talks about astrology sometimes. So, but definitely, really, I'd love to hear what he has to say about that. Oh my god. Yeah, actually, um, he just did a year um, prediction. He does a yearly prediction where he does really. Talk. Yeah, it's on their website, on the Spring Force Chugong website. Um, but he he actually predicted war around Australia and Taiwan. He said there's going to be battles, and I don't. I'm like, okay, well, well I guess we'll see what happens. Now, um, the other thing is when he, he says that the meditation energy is ten times stronger three days before and after the full moon. And I definitely three days before. That's when you're. I mean, have you ever heard me talk about that? Of like oh, yeah. when your when the moon enters your sun sign, your star sign, okay. how that starts the process of the chrism rising and going okay. to the hypothalamus. And so you're supposed to refrain from indulging sexual practices at that time, like eating crap, getting drunk, like especially during that time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I. For me, like I will feel the moon inside me before I know it's the full moon. Like I'll, I'll have this really strong magnetic bliss in the center of my brain, and then I'm like, oh, I bet it's the full moon. And then I, and then all of a sudden, you know, I'll like either see the full moon or I'll look it up on the calendar and it's the full moon. You know, but it's definitely like the moon is inside of us, and that's, you know, humans are the only primates where we are the females are synchronized like as a whole they've done studies you know where they're if you're living in nature you know as females that as a whole they're synchronized precisely with the moon cycle and what of course again if you study our original human culture they require all the males to do this spiritual training and the women are spiritual healers you know so there's a there's definitely a psychic um like there's even some science where they call it like an electro gravitic uh force from the moon and mm. that's like a psychic electro it's electro gravitic so in other words yeah there's definitely um the like 
and the other thing with this, these negative ions to bring it back to the levitation with um, John Chang, he's saying, well, if, I, if there had not been synthetic carpet, like in other words, if he had been rooted in the earth, because that's the moon controls life on earth, you know, through the water. And, and so when you're, when you're heavy, I think I mentioned to you before we went live, you know, what they call earthing, earthing or grounding, where when you're, you're barefoot on the earth, you'll get this internal tingling sensation. Now that's what they call the yin chi. And so that's, that's the negative ions and that's proven to like neutralize free radicals and heal the body. And so it's very important. Like when Chen Yi, he had to do um, the horse stance training at Shaolin. And so he would bury himself in the earth. He said he Ooh, he'd make sure he get burn. That. Ooh. <laughs> well, actually, now that you mentioned it, um, there's another guy. We sh I, he's in that uh, playlist I have where they, we, oh, yeah, I think we showed him doing the zapping. Robert Peng, he does zapping. But he started out with the horse training, and he it's actually anti-gravity. That's levitation because... Um, what happens is, is once the, what they call the Wan Chi, when you activate the Wan Chi, he said all of a sudden, like at first it was super pain, it was total pain, you know, just like you said, the burn and everything. But after a while, all of a sudden he felt buoyant. And I feel like you cross a threshold with your mind and your body. Would that then probably mm -hmm. um, generate something that changes the field around it? But, oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> yeah, and so he can, like, there's a, I have a traditional Shaolin um, training document or something and they'll they cannot move at all they'll have their thighs parallel to the ground uh, for two hours and but the only way that's possible is if you have some kind of anti-gravity going on you know you're having some kind of levitation uh, force in going activated in your body just like the videos we showed you know where there's definitely some kind of levitation. gosh that'd be so great to get like kindergartens just doing that like getting them used to standing <laughs> in that position like, all right, you get to paint afterwards, but uh, first we got to do this. That'd be well, great. Yeah. There's a, there was a professor in California, and he's, uh, I can't remember, I think his last name's Lin, also L-I-N. And he did a study where he tested people like riding bicycle and doing normal Western exercises. And he and he tested their electromagnetic fields, like what how much voltage they were putting out and on their uh, like uh, meridians, their channel, their um, active yes. channels. And there's and if you do if you do Tai Chi, you have you create way way more electromagnetic fields uh, in your body than like a high intensity workout or yeah than lifting weights or riding bicycle or something. See, we don't realize that. See, he, see, you're utilizing the secret of the yin and yang in the body, you know, with the mind and everything. And, and so we that's how a totally different way of doing exercise. See? Well, okay, like people at first my neighbors thought I was crazy because like I do this thing. It's kinda like jumping. <laughs> it's kinda like jump roping, <laughs> but without a jump, but kind of it looks kinda like shuffle dancing, like is but, that what your opening uh, video shows? <laughs> but it's like shamanic. It's it but it, and it's getting it's all about the lymphatic system too, and you're getting the lymph moving and and yeah for sure meridian but your bones are piezoelectric so everybody can think like oh working out like that makes me exhausted it's like no man it charges you like the mm -hmm. bones going and the muscles and and what is created by doing that it mm -hmm. gives you energy you're you know you're producing yeah. it yeah and the and also the col the collagen which is the most common protein in the body that's also piezo piezoelectric and it's it's 90 percent vertically aligned so that's why when you do these standing exercises with the knees bent so that in the traditional you know training these kind of yoga exercises there it's all about um the the tendons and the um ligaments you know that you're 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 stretching those and you're getting that piezoelectric charge but um there's more to it because obviously with the meditation, they're working with the, the, rel the there's a secret relativistic mass to photons. And that's what, that's what this anti-gravity comes from is that um, we're taught that, you know, the photon has a zero rest mass, but that's actually not true because when you try to, because of the quantum, what they call quantum uncertainty, you know, there's actually, there's basically a secret um, non-commutative space time to the photon. And, um, there's only a few scientists that talk about it, so it gets pretty abstract. But, but essentially, all matter is made of light, and then, but the light, the photon is not how we think of it. It's actually this eternal flowing of energy, 
and that, so that's what they call the absolute void. It's constantly radiating light, but it's also this anti-gravity. Um, and actually, Roger Penrose he he focuses on how time is asymmetric, and that's the secret of the universe. The it that's also precognitive as portal consciousness. I mean, it's not. It sounds like you know he's like ninety four years old, so he's like, well, people just ignore me as being a like an old fuddy duddy or whatever but the, actually what he's talking about is way more advanced than physicists they don't want to um same thing happened to brian josephson he got a nobel prize um and if you look up the definition of a volt in physics it's all based on the josephson effect that he got his nobel prize for but then he got into parapsychology and so now parasitology parapsychology oh yeah, parapsychology yeah. i'm like whoa <laughs> <laughs> what did you thought it said <laughs> I thought that? you said parasitology. Oh, parasite. yeah, yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. that's a leap, but that's probably like, oh, I need to hear this guy. <laughs> He's making yeah. like quantum connections. As I, as I drink tea tree oil in front of you. Oh. <laughs> I just took some green black walnut tincture yesterday. Nah, I practically live off this stuff. Like my friends, like you drank gallons of that stuff over the you years. You could drink it? I've never. No, I mean, I've been to some crazy well, stuff, Drew. But drinking, well, it's, called, it's called tea, right? I mean, it was originally given as a tea to the James Cook crew the, in James Cook expedition. You know, explorers James Cook. That's why they call it a tea, right? I mean, I'm not telling people to drink it. No, no, no. <laughs> so, I'm sure it probably pummels your gut biome. No, no, I actually looked it up. That's what my friend said too. But it, they've proven it does not kill um, bat or pro, you know, pro bacteria or anything. It's good. It's actually good for it. It's good for. It's actually fixed gut leakage too. It's the up. green black it's, walnut tincture is excellent, and it also. Um, <laughs> what have you tried it? It's antifungal no, I, too. Yeah, yeah, I am trying. I'm it, like, if you're into the tea tree, oh, wait till you try. <laughs> wait till you've seen nothing yet. Till you have the green black walnut tincture. You level up, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I I could give a whole talk on my tea trio experiences. But, um, yeah, we should one day of like going over uh, certain cleansing modalities okay. or so, using herbs to help propel you to uh, some of these samadhi states, right? Yeah, like um, another famous levitator is um, St. Teresa de Avila. And she I, was, I talk about her. I like one I of my first that. posts was, yeah, because she, because um, like I was saying really quick uh, to preface what we prefaced prior to the show was um, people came to me and were like, Julia, do you even know how you're having these visions? Um, you were like, you're just, you're talking to fallen angels. You're, you're talking to right. um, demons. And so I was like, wait, what, how am I able to, so like, who am I talking to or what, how am I able to do this? So I thought it was going to take, I think in my mind, I thought like, Oh, I'll, I'll, you know, it'll take a month, three months. I'll dive into this dude. It took two years of trying to, to, to really focus on data and information of, visions and stuff but i came across teresa avila mm -hmm. um and she has there's this amazing quote i'll i'll pull it up and bring it up yeah. later but uh of her mm -hmm. trying to differentiate um between were her visions from god or the devil like mm -hmm. and that the men in charge of her soul i'll bring up the exact quote but of her trying to differentiate that and then the conclusion she came to was that they were divine in origin mm -hmm. so um, oh, wait, I have it right here. When she shared the details of her visions and voices with the men in charge of her soul, they were mm -hmm. overcome with either reverence or suspicion. Yeah. But no one was capable of investigating Teresa more thoroughly than she was already investigating herself. She mm -hmm. subjected every one of her mystical favors to rigorous self-inquiry. Mm -hmm. She was determined to discern whether her visions came from God were delusions of the devil or were artifacts of mental imbalance. In spite of the doubts of some, she concluded that her experiences were divine in origin because they left life-changing peace in her soul and an irrevocable increase of love in her. So that was profound to me because, you know, the, the, of that rabbit hole of like, Am I crazy? Am I, the, the things you experience when you have these profound experiences and visions and the things that you're able to access and see and 
So you're like, am I crazy? Is this from the devil? Is this from God? Like, but regardless, it's like it, it caused you self inquiry. It, it caused you to take a, uh, you know, to dive down into your deepest parts of your soul and analyze. And but, anyways, yeah. So back to Teresa Avila. Well, yeah, I guess. I mean, I guess she did also levitate. I don't know. I tried reading her, but it was in Spanish, and I didn't get very far because I'm like. I'm kind of lazy, but let's read in Spanish. Or, Ooh, but. yeah, we should do a show on her in the future. That would be great of, like, getting some, uh, you know, translated, you know, some of it translated and covered. That would be amazing. There, Yeah, there is actually some on YouTube. There's somebody reading her stuff that um, I listened to. I listened to it, but it wasn't, like, I'm sure she, she has, like, probably tons of stuff that, but um, as far as her levitation, I do know that she... She told her other nuns to just stay in the nunnery, do not go out, because when you go into this deep, like meditation, you, you know, you have, like people are going to think you're strange because you're having these deep physiological changes, you know, which mm -hmm. obviously, obviously levitation is a good example, but, but you know, she basically she told the other nuns like, you know, don't show this stuff in public, like it, mm. it, people are not going to understand it. I know that's why even discussing it, people, you know, it's like, well, Julia, are you sure you want to cover this? I'm like, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Well that's, well, that's why I just I always sit in full lotus because it's like I had actually my most um, my most one of I had an article. One of my early articles got um, re it got used in a class on parapsychology. I think it was in Canada and my article it was in French. That's what it was. In, so I think it was like in Quebec or something. And the article is called "You Cannot, You Can't Fake the Full Lotus," and it's a it's a um, a pun on faking um, female orgasms because when you sit in full lotus for males, like you're having the female um, you know bliss or whatever, like the Vegas nerve that I talked about a, a bit with Bernie. So it's a different experience for men and women sitting in that position. No, it's the same. There's a, there was an article on the um, the Qigong Institute by a lady who sat in full lotus meditation and she she openly said she would have you know orgasms when she made you hear that ladies <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh oh, that's hilarious but um anyway what was i getting out of this but the um my point is like when people are trying to you know call other people crazy like you know like we're the it's only new zealand and the u.s allow big pharma advertising on tv which is you know obviously you turn the tv on it's all just being mind controlled by big pharma you know so everybody thinks they're a shrink you know what i mean like you know okay well <laughs> my point is like i did if you just sit in full lotus it's like okay either you can either sit in it or you can't you know what i mean like that's that's so that's what i do personally i just I, just said, I, look, I remember like, I dated I this said, guy and he thought I was weird because I, I would sit in Indian style in the passenger seat of his car. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I I mean, I would not be, I would not hold that against my, <laughs> any girlfriend. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, yeah, so, okay. Okay, so okay, the the what do you call? It? I know that we want to talk about the poltergeist. Um, the pult, yeah. The, the thing about the, poltergeist is that the as as what John Chang explained. Yeah, to get back to John Chang is that when you have a poltergeist that that exhibits telekinesis or levitation, it's it's usually it, it's involving young young people, and so the the ghost is using the yang the yang chi of the young person. Because when you're young, your yang chi is really strong. It's the strongest. Okay, so are we talking like painting the room here, painting this, creating this environment of this vibe? So it's like a kid laying down in bed and they're unwillingly being literally levitated. levitated. So this isn't like some cool guru like trying to do it. It's unwilling right. and it's usually a child and yeah. they're floating. And are they awake? Like, do they awake? Like, oh, God, mom, what's happening? What's yeah, I mean, they could be, or they there could be people watching. I mean, there's, I think Michael Manning, who's you know a Nobel physicist, Brian Josephson, he recommended to me Michael Manning, and I read his book, and it's like the most famous poltergeist case in um, England. And I read the book, and I was just flabbergasted. But um, I think yeah, he he levitated. He was levitating basically. That's that's what they're saying. He also did a lot of channeling where he would write in other languages, and he did this amazing artwork, and and um. And then he finally went to India and he was sitting 
meditating in the Himalayas, and he says, I need to become a healer. I need to use this energy for healing or whatever, because it you know, opened up. But anyway, um, I still get his emails, Michael Manning, because I read his book, and I looked him up, and I you know, can get free emails from him. But when he was a kid, yeah, he had this um, meditation happen to him. And so the thing is, is like the yin chi and the yang chi is different. Like the yang chi is based on your life force energy, your reproductive energy. And so obviously as a person ages, they tend to use that up. Um, well, you know, females, they live uh, seven years longer than males on average. And mm -hmm. that's because, because obviously males, they're, they're losing their, like, like, see, the, the, what's interesting for males is that, um, Oh, I, I posted this as a comment on, on your channel about the the male um, the neural neural myelination of your myelination of your nerves is a byproduct of the less lecithin, like when you have lecithin, and and then when a male um, loses his you know reproductive fluid, that's mainly lecithin. That's mainly made up of lecithin. So like in the West, we're thought, oh, that's it's healthy. You gotta you know you gotta Clear out the tubes or whatever, they call it, you know. But actually, um, it, that lecithin is what myelinates your nerves, and so so this is this. And that when you myel, okay, like John Chang, he said he's just like an electric eel. His his ability to zap people is just like an electric eel. So if you look up how an electric eel works, they they're storing the charge in their fat in the hmm. which is essentially the lecithin in the in the neurons. So they have. Isn't there have a lot of lecithin in eggs? Yeah, in eggs and in uh, soy also, but so like Buddhist monks will eat soy, but you know Taoists will eat eggs, and 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 of course you don't want to overcook the eggs because you want you want that lecithin you want it to eat it you don't want to mm, damage runny eggs <laughs> sourdough, <laughs> and so um, yeah so. My point being is that there is a direct connection between celibacy and like what they what the Taoists they call it like um like I think it's like charging up the brain, feeding the brain or something like that. You no, know, in other words, there's a direct connection between your cerebral spinal fluid and your celibacy, which you know, they kinda knew that in folklore, you know, they'll say like, Well, before the big fight, you know, you got you make sure you you know you don't sleep around or whatever. I don't know, but that you know what I mean? Like they they there's like there's that that folklore connection, but then Western scientists will say, no, you know, it's not healthy. You know, like you get, you know, the guys will get like, like we had, Oh, it's in my, my alchemy playlist, which, um, I don't know if you watched it, but we didn't get a chance to show it with Bernie, but they, the guy getting kicked in the groin over and over. Did you ever see that one? Yes. Or, so I was like, mm -hmm. well, this, this disproves Joe Rogan right here. Like he's, he wants to dismiss uh, traditional martial arts as being just, you know, hokum, you know, superstitious, whatever. But the, but when you're when you meditate a lot in martial arts, you literally pull the the males pull their the the vagus nerve connects the right side vagus nerve connects to the testes for males, and it, for the females it connects to the cervix. So that's the right side vagus nerve is actually like the secret of the of the kundalini or whatever. And so mm. when, you're still, when you're storing up that charge for males, it actually will suck the. Um, you know, scroll them back inside the body. And that's why they're able to, they get kicked over and over and over. So like in the West, we think, oh, you got to have big balls and all that. But but it's the exact opposite. In the Taoist um, training, you're actually trying to suck them back inside your body. Mm. You're storing up that vagus nerve charge. And so Joe Rogan, he doesn't know anything about this. And, and obviously people won't care because if you don't know, if you, you know, ignorance and bliss, right? Like people just don't know. So, um, Wilhelm Reich did start to figure this out. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he was a Yeah, uh, Brittany and wants to do a show about him. She has amazing oh, yeah. information, uh, and hopefully we do that in the next couple months. Okay. Yeah, because Wilhelm Reich in the 1930s, he made the connection between the vagus nerve, lecithin, and, um, and serotonin in the body. And he's like... That's the secret of this orgone energy, what he called orgone with the blue light. And then, and um, he wasn't quite there, but it didn't get translated into English until like 
I don't know, like 2,000. Well, that's what's so significant years. about doing parasite cleanses and the parasites go off of the moon and the parasites are stealing your serotonin. That is literally their drug of choice. So then them taking your, them stealing your serotonin is there th therefore throwing off you and making people sad and this and that. So it's like, dude, take, you know, imagine that th it's a happy hormone that resides inside of you. Mm -hmm. So don't you want that? Like, do you want somebody punking you for it like jacking you or do you want it for yourself and because then it throws off everything else in your system so that's why it's, it's another uh great example of a way to look at why parasite cleanse and you know we can speaking of the serotonin is key and of the, of the epiphanies and getting to that state i completely agree with that and okay so in terms of parasites and stealing, we can start talking about psychic vampires. Yeah, let's. Yes, <laughs> this is like this is the best Sunday ever. <laughs> best conference. This is like this is the yeah, stuff yeah. that I'm into. Well, <laughs> basically, the problem is again, it has to do with males because, see, like if you listen to like um, you know, like National Public Radio, they'll have. You know, if you ever listen to National Public Radio, NPR, you know, they'll have, like, Science Fridays and all that. And they'll they'll start talking about um, orgasms, and they'll just equate the male and the female as being, you know, both having orgasms. But in fact, Are we talking about energy-gasms? Yeah, well, not... See, the thing is, is that... See, the energy-gasm, it works through the female vagus or the right side vagus. Nerve. And so the problem is, is that with males, they will get... the if you like if you read robert sapolsky he's pretty famous now he's on youtube a lot but i he's a stanford physiologist and primatologist and he has this book called the trouble with testosterone and he describes how you know like the male is is feeling um what's the word like lustful or whatever getting getting into it and they're like and then when but the, when the male climaxes what happens is the sympathetic nervous system gets spiked and that spikes the male's cortisol level so the uh, the lust is actually dopamine, right? And so, you said lust. You said lust is dopamine. Yeah, okay. it's dopamine. And so people they love most drugs are dopamine, right? Like you want dopamine, you know, like coffee and cocaine or whatever. I've never Wait, isn't like I, I think I was talking about this the other night. It was um, oxycodone, like oxycotton yeah. is like uh, they kind of duplicated the love mode, like the oxytocin. That's why yeah. you know, so it's like impossible well, not to fall in love with it type thing. Um, molecular huh? well i know it's definitely dopamine because that's like heroin that's synthetic heroin heroin's also dopamine. so do you said dopamine is lust yeah and so i and like what, that quote that's a good that's good and so what happens is that the you get addiction by the males like you know where because what happens is they they when they when they end up you know climaxing it spikes their sympathetic nervous system with the stress as cortisol that does mm. not happen. That does not happen for females. So the problem mm. is, is that males males are constantly pulling the energy down, and it, every time they're spiking. See, if you want to store up energy, you have to keep it in the vagus nerve system because the vagus nerve is deeper, deeper relaxation. And there's this Harvard medical doctor. He calls it the relaxation response. And he went and studied these Tibetan yogis in about with the uh, tumult, which is you know you've heard of Wim Hof creating that internal heat of Wim Hof, Wim Hof, Wim Hof. Yeah, uh-huh. So that's based on, that's two more yoga, yoga where he's creating this huge amount of internal heat. Well, that's actually what they call the relaxation response where you're going deeper and deeper in your vagus nerve. And you're doing that using breathing, breath, breath uh, exercises. Hmm. And so so the point is, is that um, if you're a typical male, like especially um, in our culture, so the males, they can become psychic vampires, essentially. Some of some males, you know, it's more common. Unfortunately, it's more. But so the problem is, is that. Um, Wait. So, by, but when you say, yeah, what do you uh, expand on, upon that? Because are well, you talking about will, using a female or like the, that process? Or they will they will suck off other people's energy so they can ejaculate, and they will feed off that. So they're in, the, in other words, they will constantly, constantly, constantly suck off other people's energy so then they can ejaculate again. Like lusting, watching porn, like what do we? <laughs> no, they're just like, just like they don't like in real life. They'll like with other people. Like if they're around another person, they can psychically suck off the other person's life force energy, and they, they're yin chi. They can suck off their yin chi energy 
and then use that energy so they can get off again. But they're so they're being parasitical because they're constantly turning it into reproductive fluid and losing it. And then once as soon as they lose it, they're drained. They need it. They need it again. So they're parasites. So they got to go suck out. Another. I know this one guy. He uh, he'll grab like <laughs> if you break uh, eye contact with them, like he needs you. He he'll, he'll lean really close to you and like and grab you. And so what I like to do is like oh, look yeah. away. <laughs> Just I'm like, oh, watch watch this. Like it's like it's entertain. Like because it's funny to me of like. But he needs everybody locking eyes with them, and then right. you know it, he'll. But it's like the most obvious, like physical right. version of like a psychic band. But it's like no, you know I feel it. No, don't don't look away. Look at me. Don't look away. Don't look at me. Oh, don't look away. Yeah, and it's all based on the frequency of light because we don't realize like with the chakras, like that that type of person, their their intention, what they call e e or e. In Chinese, often the Y I. The heart, the heart energy. Well, actually, well, it doesn't. It see the intention is actually based on the frequency of light in the body, so it's it can become hardwired in a person. So, in other words, like if a person, but it goes through the heart. So, well, it's 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 everything goes through the heart eventually, like especially at. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So ideally, ideally it would go through the heart. Unfortunately, some people have their frequency of light in their body as a hardwired intention. This gets back to the virtual photons. The frequency, the intention, it's like your hardwired soul. It's like your soul as your intention. So it's what they call the magnetic moment of a virtual photon. In other words, it's like the gravitational mass of the light in your body, like your soul. So in other, some people, their intention is stuck in their lower body. You know, as a as a psychic mm. vampire, so their their the color is like a dark, like a black hole, you know, because they're parasitical that way. And so you can actually sense if somebody's intention is stuck down there. Like they could be their personality; they could be trying to be as nice as possible and blah blah blah. But a personality is different than somebody's actual intention. You know what I mean? Like they're. Mm. And so so that the the and they can't even control it because they're hardwired that way because of mm. something that something could have happened to them when they were young and then see if you're young and you haven't gone through puberty yet it can get hardwired that way you know that's like what freud talked about right like so this is what this is why somebody who's abused then becomes an abuser you know like a, the psychic family but yeah they recreate the trauma i noticed that a lot is uh what we do is some, anything that traumatized it could have been like you know having to move and your family lost all the money you know, like, and you became really poor and dusty. Like, you will recreate that financial trauma. Like, the way that we recreate the trauma is, uh, well, one, that's what one, we have to, what we're learning not to do. <laughs> there's one thing in anthropology that I came across is that the Aztecs actually spread pederasty into the Mayan, the Mayan civilization. Wait, it Aztecs was, spread uh, pedophilia? Pederasty. What is pederasty? Okay, well, like pedophilia in Greek, the etymology, ped, peter means boy, and philia means love. Now, if so if you're really mind controlled, you're going to call something the opposite of what it means. In other words, people are going around calling it boy love when mm. it's the opposite of love. Now, pederasty, it also means boy, but asti, I don't know what that means in Greek, but it's kind of gets the point across is like they're targeting it's this the aztec culture so-called culture this is an anthropology it's it's well documented they spread that into the mayan culture where you know like just like, like with the catholic church it happened right but this is the this was considered the norm of where the younger males were targeted and then just like you know routinely raped over and over and over and then it gets hardwired so then when they're older they do it to the younger males and you have a whole culture based on that. And this is what I love about the indigenous cultures that would, the males would gather, you know, and one of them, when one of them stepped out of line, <laughs> whether it was like a 14 year old or, you know, 40 or what, no matter the age, they would take them out to a fire, beat his ass, and then let him cry it out. But it set the precedence of the community of like, listen, we're going to handle this as men all together, and you're going to have all of us to answer to. You start stealing, raping, perving out like whatever it is we're going to handle you as a unison and you know and there's usually like a deeper emotional 
reason it's like getting to the root of it too when he's crying it out <laughs> of like what's really going on and then you know or you get ostracized or like you're no longer you get thrown out or sometimes killed but of handling that is men well actually the um have you ever have you ever looked at the bonobos? there could be no boy loving around here <laughs> what you know, you know the bonobos have you heard of the bonobos but there, there's chimpanzees right you heard of chimpanzees but there's also bonobos and for bono- there, those are our closest um, cousins, right? Oh yeah, yeah. You talked about this, uh huh. But the bonobos, the the females are constantly having orgasms together. The females are they call it G to G rubbing. In all the girls, all of the female chimps. Yeah, they well, they're bonobos. They're not. They're, they're not. They're actually like a separate. They're. I mean, they're they're called like a. I think you call it like a. Not a subspecies, but they have a different term. For it. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So all of the females are gathered together, and they do it in unison at the same time. No, not like an orgy, but they but they call it G to G rubbing. That's what primatologists call it. The, the term, the phrase, the term is G to G rubbing, which means genitalia to genitalia rubbing. And this they do it all the time. The female, the, the, that's just how they deal with social. If any male gets out of line, the, all the females as a group will attack that male. The bonobos. They have no, they have no any no significant violence at all. Their culture is completely based on the female orgasm. And That's so, also like reminding me of Queen Calafia. Have you looked into that? I, I know who's Queen Calafia. Queen Calafia, they, there's uh, say that's what California was named after, and it was like oh. these women, and they had, it was like a women based. Imagine. Um, what was that movie? Matriarchy. Matriarchy. Yes, yes, yes. But the, in Wonder Woman, how they're like gladiators yeah. or whatever. Like, imagine yeah. that, but like oh, on dude. an island, because California was an island, and there's proof of that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but they were, you know, a matriarch. They were oh, yeah. all women, and uh, they had gold and all these amazing gemstones, and they basically, but they were all female. And so uh, they would trade. They, there's talks of stories of being on Griffin and kind of being like Amazonian strong women. And they would fly around on these Griffin and had all these jewels, like amazing wait, jewels wait, and I'm gold. And then, but the thing is, they had, they would give their boys, they would have sons and they would give them away. But I was like, so wait, they had, they had a few dudes on the, like breaking them off. And then, wait, you know, because, so- but there are stories around the world that speak of going to this island. And that, um, and then talking about the jewels and doing trades, like there's stories that back this up, and it's something I vibe with. But when you're talking about these, the subspecies of chimps, and they're all women, I don't know. It just reminds me of the Queen Calafia Island of all those women. Just is that off California? Warrior S's. No, it's in like in California, like literally, because California was an island. Oh, on California. But maybe it wasn't, you know, maybe it was like Santa Rosa or, you know, or Catalina or could have been, but. Okay. So, but this is actually, I've never, never heard of Queen Health. Oh, it's, I love, I love that info. I should do a video on that in the future of just like an, you know, of like is the that, story. You, and there's great information name? on it. Huh? How do, you, how do you spell her last name? That last, that name? Calafia, C A. C A L A F I A. Oh, okay. Cool. So, but is California named after her? That's what they uh, say. Could oh. be. Ah, cool. Yeah, so, um, anyway, the. Yeah, so if you think about patriarchy, like, I've, I've been reading this guy, um, this professor, he has a book called War of Chimpanzees in History or chimpanzees war in history and basically he's saying well war did not exist before uh, agriculture was invented and um, humans have been around for 200,000 years genetically modern humans and so a- agriculture has only been around for as a you know with plows and all that like for 10,000 years so um, until it wasn't until we started having hierarchical culture where you had the, the plows and the hoarding of food and all that where you could really control people and then use um, male violence. But before that, the it would the females were, were in control of the land, the youth the land use. Mm. Um, and this is and it's a big even in anthropology, it's like there's a book called The Harmless People by mm-hmm. um, Dr. Elizabeth Marshall Thomas and she lived with the original human culture in the nineteen fifties. 
and I corresponded with her uh, through email. And her book, you know, she lived with the, the Sam Bushman people in um, for two years, and her parents were famous anthropologists too. And she, so she had this book published, and it's a really awesome book, uh, The Harmless People. But the male anthropologists, they could not handle it because she's documenting this culture. They trained all the males to be spiritual healers. They had no violence. You know, and this is our original human culture that we're all from genetically. It's well proven. You know, so people I don't like, know anything about it. They don't. I like hearing about, about that um, because uh, this is a kind of a this is a weird story. I'm gonna try to paraphrase it real quick. Uh, I was hopping on a flight. <laughs> yeah. I was going somewhere. <clears throat> and I was going to visit this person that's very or going to go to go there for a while. And they're very gifted in advance and they have certain abilities that are pretty out of this world. Right. <clears throat> yeah. But I call I, I order an Uber to get a, a ride to the airport. Right. Uh -huh. And uh, there's never any Ubers in my town, like in my city, like at all. I'm never I've never taken Uber. So. Oh, you're like, what is an Uber? So um, <laughs> I so I order it and it's on my street, okay, okay. which is weird because there's, I'm telling you, there's never Ubers in town. And if there is, like, you have to wait a while. Like, it's already on my street. Yeah. So I was like, that's weird. What? The guy shows up and he's like, do you need help with your bags? It was like, yes, I do. Like, because it's, you know, you got to go down these stairs. It's the process. I was like, right. I go, you're an angel. You are an angel. And he was like, thanks. And, you know, we must have been 22, 23. Mm -hmm. And so I get in the car and I really go, I'm an intent. Like, I like to get to the root. Like, I don't want to talk to you about the weather. I want to talk to you about, like, deep stuff, you know, of, like what's really going on. Or, like, I like to get to the heart of the matter. So, yeah. like, I get in the car. and But I'm not used to other people doing that to me, especially straight from the jump. And I get in the car and it was like, he hits me with, like, this, like, this statement about God, I, I guess he was like a really big Christian mm -hmm. and, but we hadn't even been like, Hey, how are you? You know, like it was just, just straight to the point.com. And he was very much like, he said something about God that was profound. And then it was, you know, Julia, people that have healing gifts and abilities, it's not from God. It's from below. <laughs> and I was like, er, like, what are the odds? You know what I'm saying? Like of the place I'm going to, I'm about to hop on this plane. And so the next half an hour, I mean, it was a pretty wild conversation, but that of, of, of that, uh, cause we were talking about, uh, poltergeist and, uh, sometimes vision, you know, and that being attested to visions and to, uh, telekinesis, um, levitation being tied to, to demons or darker forces. So hopping in the car and the guy saying, look, you know, healing medallion, like that's not, that's from, that is from the, and the people, you know, that, that was, I was like, wait, so you don't believe in that. Wait, so Jesus was the healer, you know, of that ig igniting that, that talk and of, so, so was he, you know, like, so what's your view on that? If it's from below and Jesus was the healer, what would he, you know? And so, Yeah. So, so you want, you're asking me like, oh, well, I mean, no. So yeah. the whole, oh, yeah. The, what? You're, I thought you're going to finish this. The, so the say? whole, like, um, of maintain of like, okay, that, that of entertaining that of, um, of practicing these things, uh, is it conjuring? Is it, is it from a darker for how you feel about that? Okay. Yeah, actually, um, there's this guy, um, Ramana Maharshi from India. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he um, he t he practiced something called Advaita Vedanta, which is uh, one of the most famous philosophies of India. But it's based on this idea of non-dualism, right? So the idea, I mean, basically, his 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 view of reality is that the whole universe is an illusion, and the only thing, because the only thing that's actually eternal, that's is what he calls formless awareness. Now that's like in the West, the closest term I would find to that is this, in Latin, it's called creatio ex nihilo, which is creation out of nothing. Mm, like, this is something, like, this is nothing. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and of course, like um, modern science, that's what they say too. Like there's this, that guy Lawrence Krauss, he's got a book like the, I don't know, the universe out of nothing or something like that. 
but um, the universe is created out of zero energy or something. But it's not really zero because of this non-commutativity. You have this eternal flowing, and that's the problem with the West is we tend to think of of eternity as something static, whereas what it is is like. So what Ramana Maharshi is saying, he also he also call it the undifferentiated triad. You know, so that's why I was mentioning with Bernie is this is this, it's a, actually a three in one thing. So you have this eternal flowing of energy, but it's impersonal. So what his meditation method is that his idea was that, well, everything is based on the I thought. Like as soon as you wake up, all your perceptions, your sense of reality is from the I thought, your sense of I. So any kind of visions you have, any other like it's this this could get um it could get interpreted as um what do they call it uh so solipsism the term is is called solipsism in okay what does that mean? well it basically means you think the whole universe is your own is created out of your own mind you know like i could say like you're you're an illusion that i created you know what i mean like that would be solipsism where everything is a product of your own mind but the but the, but it's not it's not that it at all because it's not saying it's your own mind it's saying it's this formless awareness in other words like okay like when you go to sleep at night you go into deep dreamless sleep you know where they they'll document they call it slow wave sleep where um your your the delta waves they also call it delta waves right Mm -hmm. now so but as for you as a person you know you're not a biological machine right like most people they would not want to think they're a machine that just turns on in the morning, right? Like, a so soul cyborg, man. We're soul cyborgs. <laughs> <laughs> we're so, tapping into another field, though. Like, if you're just really honest about who you are, then you have to admit that you still exist when you're in deep dreamless sleep. Even though space-time doesn't exist, your mind it doesn't exist, you have no perceptions at all, there's still something there that's still you. Now, what he's saying is that if you, if you just keep while you're awake and you, if you just keep searching, if you literally repeat I, I, I over and over in your mind, but not as a mantra, but as a, a logical investigation, because what is the source of your I thought? And you take that, if you take your thinking very, very seriously and you just say, okay, I just had another thought that was based on my I thought. Hmm. And what, where does that I come from? So then you end up just keep repeating I, I, I over and over. God, I feel like I'd get lost in sauce. Okay, sorry, keep going. You get lost in in thoughts? No, like I feel like I'd get lost in the sauce of like I, I, I. (laughs) Like there's sometimes things that are literal. Like I I just, I don't know. I just maybe just do it just a different way. Like I just, like I get my mind to go into these states, but through deep breathing or certain thought like mantras, I'm I'm like, what? I, I don't know. Well, that's but, a, his whole point is it's not a technique. It's not like the meditation. It's literally like you're just looking for the truth of reality. Mm-hmm. And eventually, eventually you create, you're creating space between your thoughts. You're listening to your I thought. You're realizing there's nothing there. That there's the source of your I thought is nothing you can hold on to. You eventually you end up listening to the source of your I thought. And he says eventually you'll see a light. And he says that there's a, there's a secret pinhole to the universe on the right side of the heart. And he's like, if you visualize light. King light oil? Side, Wait, what did you say? Uh, sorry, I have my Minnesota accent. A, uh, pin, a pin hole. P-I-N-H-O-L. Pinhole. Pinhole. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> the pinhole on the right side of your heart. A secret, a secret, a secret passageway to the universe. <gasps> and that, and if you listen to the source of the light on the right side of your heart, you will suddenly get sucked in to this the formless awareness of the universe beyond your body, beyond death. Even. Oh, Drew, I love this. Oh, <laughs> my God. That's the best thing I've heard all year. No, he says a lot of people will want to see the self as light. They'll want to, you know, like Westerners, we, we're really, we're, we're just stuck on visualization. Like, it's got to be a light. It's got to be something. It's got to be a voice. It's got to be a spirit or whatever. It's got to be an astral realm. No, no, it's none of that. It says you cannot see it, but it is like an ether force that's formless awareness. And you can feel this is what they call Shakti, you know. And I've had this, I had this, um, uh, Jim Nance actually gave me this experience where I was driving the car and, you know, she won master Jim Nance. He was in the passenger seat in the front. And uh, I had been hanging, we'd been hanging out around this time. And um, I was, I was ranting about, um, 
Cargill. Cargill is the largest private corporation in the world, and they're based in Minnesota. They're an agribusiness corporation. And I was ranting about how evil Cargill was, and I kept ranting and ranting because I'm a political, I was a political activist, and I had a career as a political activist. And um, he's finally, he's like, but Drew, I'm on your side. And he's like a really big guy, you know, like he's like, you don't, you know, you're not. And, but I didn't really believe him. I mean, I just kept ranting and ranting about Cargill. And then he got super, super silent. And then all of a sudden I'm thinking, wait, he's like, he's super, super silent. And then all of a sudden I felt this really strong, um, like electrical force deep on the right side of my heart. Like it was coming from like within me, like beyond my life, my body. It was deep on the right side, really strong electrical force, like scary, strong. And I just immediately shut up, you know, and then, and as I shut up, I'm sitting there, shut up driving, I'm still driving. And in the quiet, he all of a sudden says, I just wanted to see if you're speaking from your heart and you were, and that's how he said to me. And then I'm just like, okay, like, like he could have, you know, just like, I love it. Jim Nance just like airbendered you. He was like, whoosh, check your heart. <laughs> it's authenticated, like <laughs> verified. He sounds like such a badass. I got to meet Jim one day. Shoot some hoops with him. You're breaking up a little bit. What'd you say? I lo- Oh, no. I'm not plugged in. Hold on. Oh, no, I can hear you. I can hear you. are good okay. now. All right. Little poltergeist. Lost, uh, yeah, he, he moved to Mexico. He just moved to Mexico. Oh, he's right by me. <laughs> yeah, well, he's on the other side. Actually, um, there, Chenny Lin's doing a Mayan pyramid uh, meditation um, class uh, in the Yucatan. He likes meditating at the Mayan pyramids. So really? That's, yeah, that's where Jim Nance moved to right around there. So that's where they live. No. So I'll probably never see him again. You know? well, oh, I'm supposed- don't say that. Well, he probably, well, you know, like all. He's like, like a probably- one thought away. I just, yeah, like, just close sure. your eyes. Go to that spot in your heart. I'll be there. <laughs> I'll see you there. <laughs> Anyway, so that's, I'm just saying that um, if anybody gets on your case about religion or he- heaven or hell, there's something that this, this advice to Vedanta, the non dualism is like, it's beyond heaven and hell. You know, but that's what quantum physics also says now is that there's this reality that's beyond space time. Mm. It's, it's non locality, it's, it's pure time and frequency. And it, it exists before the Big Bang, it exists after the universe is gone, you know, it's still there. It's this eternal time. That's it's Roger Penrose says asymmetric time. It's highly coherent. It's proto consciousness as information. It's also precognitive, and it's the source of our um, being alive. Also, and it's anti gravity. Oh, I kept you going for an hour and a half now. So probably. <laughs> there's so much to cover. No, that's okay. But is there anything else you want to add on any oh. of? I know I kind of derail you a little bit. But of things that I'm, I'm like I have to mention this. Yeah, I, had, I got, I got like I had Christians coming after me for you know because they thought because I just sit in full lotus. I would just sit in full lotus in public all the time. You know, and they're just like, oh, it's demonology. <laughs> right. If like certain things of certain responses would be helpful because it's like wait, so because like I'm not supposed to activate certain things. You know what I mean? With me, well, they're going to attest this to, and I think that's what I like debating about and speaking of, of like activating certain powers and, and tapping into a field of, of, of attributing of that, of, of finding and discovering um, like the benevolence within that, the divinity within that. Because a lot of people are going to say like that's, your idol, you know, this idolatry, your, you think this very Luciferianism of activity, you, you know, you being the God and that, you know, when you like that, that's a malevolent practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is the whole point is that the, for, the formless awareness as proto conscious, excuse me, it's not you. It's what it's in Indian philosophy. They call it Turiya. So you have, you have four states of awareness. You have a waking, dreaming, then deep dreamless sleep, and then you have Turiya. Turiya means beyond deep dreamless sleep. Now that's the formless awareness. That's the truth of reality. That's who you, it's not only, if they also call it Atman equal, equals equals Brahman, which means like basically your soul is, 
is unified with the universe, but it's not personal, it's impersonal. And so basically, this is what the Tibetan Book of the Dead also explains. Like when everybody dies, the very first thing they experience is the greatest love they will ever experience in their life is when they die. But but that's also impersonal and it's this, it's so bright that your most people's spirits can't handle it because you're going mm. right into that absolute void as an impersonal um, source of the universe. And usually most people's um, souls have some kind of like emotional blockages. Mm. So, they, so they, they don't stay in that, see? So then they go they go to heaven or whatever, you know, based on... See, like Chun Yi Lin, he heals ghosts. He, you know, the ghosts come to him to get healed. And the, and also that Fra, the Fra Artun Moon book that I mentioned that has levitation in it, that he also heals ghosts in that book, the biography, the the Thai Thai Buddhist monk. It's a free biography you can read you know, Fra Artun Moon. Um, so he, he describes healing ghosts also. And so it's these spiritual Buddhist masters. They near death. When, when I was actually born, my mom had a near death experience, and oh. uh, yeah, I began to hemorrhage, and she had this outer wow. body. She said she floated over her body, wow. and that um, she was smiling, thinking, "What's Lenny? My dad's name is um, Leonard." She's like, "What's Lenny? What's Lenny gonna do with four kids?" And she just thought it was hilarious, you know, and. She was very peaceful and very this, but I remember t- attesting to, um, like, that it had something to do with my soul. <laughs> like, that it was, mm-hmm. like, my fault for a long time. Like, I thought it was my fault and something about my soul, my vibration, and or maybe that needing to happen, maybe that of, of coming into the world and setting the tone mm-hmm. off that of, like, that's yeah, going to make it, that's going to have an impact on my soul. And, you mm-hmm. know, of what came first, the chicken or the egg, did my soul, and you know, induce that, or, you know, the before or after type thing. Yeah, that's 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 another thing that uh, Chen Yi does is he reads past lives. He, he sees people's past lives, and um, but he rarely tells people unless it, it's necessary to help them heal. Mm, one time I was talking to this guy, and um, his face started morphing. Like where it, it showed um, his feet, and he's like, um, he's French, Italian, and uh, was fluent in French. But anyways, his face started morphing, and he turned into a, um, a I don't know, some type of Asian. And um, then it, it showed this like old pirate. Then it morphed into this like old pirate that looked like it had been weathered at sea, and he had a gray beard. And, and he so it showed me like three or four different, um, several faces of talking to him. But I remember as it was happening, I was like, "Do I tell him?" <laughs> like, it's like, you know, I'm completely sober. I'm talking to him. I'm seeing it morph. But that of like, there's certain things that's like, do I tell them? They didn't ask, but and so yeah, no, I had to say something because it was becoming so surreal. Of, you know, I was like, hey, and so I had to go over it. But I feel like it was a past life thing. But so he doesn't tell people. Well, yeah, actually, there's if you there's this other guy Punjaji in India. I read his memoir, which is really amazing. He um. He had like bilocation, you know, we created other physical bodies and all that. And but he said the same thing where when he looked into people's eyes, he could see their past lives. Because mm. basically your your soul is coming out of your eyes, you know, like your spirit and all that. And so if you go really deep into somebody's eyes, you can connect back to mm. the source to the source of that from a from their generational energy from your past lives or whatever. And if anybody wants a past life, um, if anybody wants to do that, um, email me, Julia at JuliaCammon.com for um, a hypnosis regression session. And I will guide you through it. And we'll see what comes up. Sounds good. I I, uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm not interested in my past lives. I don't know why. but No, I, I get it. I, I see. The thing is, the other thing is, like, when we look at Western modern civilization so-called civilization the fact is is that we are destroying life there's a there's a phrase called biological annihilation and you can look that up in google scholar if anybody uses google scholar but the fact is is you know because of our ecological crisis like all of our um roger penrose he says well there's gravitational entropy 
and that's the opposite of the entropy of matter. So all of our technology, we're de trying to decrease the entropy of matter, but we're increasing gravitational entropy. And, and the, so we're actually destroying life like inherent to our modern technology. And so, you know, the, like, like we might not, you know, it might take 10 million years for, for dude, Drew, we need to focus cover. on the water and getting clean freaking water. You know what I mean? Like first things yeah. first, like let's I, get the water. There are so it. many crazy things in our water and getting that out and is going to help so much. Like, I actually ugh. worked at I worked at Clean Water Action for ten years. Ten years I worked at Clean Water Action. That was my after I got my master's degree. Well, actually, when I was I took the job when I was finishing my master's degree. I was working there part time. I stayed. I just worked part time because I was like in retirement, basically. Because I got arrested eight, eight times you know, doing activism and it, protesting. My yeah, my master's degree was in activism. Like I did a, a certificate. You little shit went, starter. <laughs> I'm just yeah. Oh, no, the, 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 <laughs> Rebel. The yeah, the university president emailed me, the University of Minnesota. He's like, please do not go on unlimited hunger strike. <laughs> but, <sighs> um, so at any rate, yeah. The, so I'm just saying that. A, the, our ecological crisis is much, much worse than people realize because the Arctic, the Arctic is about to go out. It's free, and the, you know, like, like global warming that was proven 200 years ago by Joseph Fourier. Ooh, but, I don't know if you want to discuss this with me though, Drew. I got yeah, some pretty, yeah. no, yeah. like I just, uh, I get really, I don't know, I get heated over the whole global warming thing, and it's like the weather modification is occurring 100 uh percent, -huh. and. It's it's totally being toyed with and doctored and man, I, I just feel like we definitely should focus on like immediate solutions of we have this most abundant resource in the world and it's water. And so yeah. the fact it's crazy to me of like that we're even struggling that we don't have that. And then the, the sources of the, the fluoride in it of. Uh -huh. And what's being clearly added to it, and um, just yeah. the fact that the fact that uh, getting you know, and there's no water bottle company like you can't get water uh, that doesn't have fluoride in it. Because I was like, no way, Evian doesn't have fluoride, and it's like, nope, sure enough, even Evian. Like, you, and you so, ever, but anyways, the, so I'm uh, you know uh, all about this water, water machine, you, huh? What is that? It's a Berkey water filter. Oh, that's right. That's right. We just these, we just talked these about. These are great. This and they're actually, they're making them illegal, right? <laughs> these aren't illegal. This no, but they're, they're they're coming after them. I mean, that's helping people, a lot of people. But they're oh. they came after them I don't, uh, I, because. I didn't, know that. I didn't hear. Yeah, lo looking. Yeah, it's, it's sad. Coconut. It really bums me out. They're just coconut husk fiber. I don't know why they would come after. I don't. I don't have the article to explain it <clears throat> or whatever. Yeah, yeah, but we could do a future water. I'm always down. I want to do lots of um, water streams. They might. They, it might be their fluoride filter, maybe because they because they have a different kind of filter with about fluoride that I think was problematic. So maybe that was a Berkey. Um, but basically, it's like get your Berkey water filter now before it, you can no longer get it anymore. Yeah. Um, I'm. I'm not. I'm trying to hand. Uh, I'm trying to drill a water hole on my land. Up nice. North. Um, and um, you know the water crisis. I wrote a. I have an op-ed that I had published in the university newspaper um, in the year 2000 about called "Water Crisis Sucks Us Into Global Revolution." That was my water op-ed, and I said in 25 years. We will be running out of fresh water on the planet and that was in the year 2000 i had that published well th this is what, what upsets me is that there's these ancient i come across a lot of remote viewing there's a lot of um ancient aqueducts and there's all the geothermal waters beneath us there's geysers there's this inner earth water that's healing it, it's it's very good for our health it's uh you know you got lords france is a great example there's places around the world where people go there and they get healed right like this water is abundant and there's lots of it beneath the earth now it's been di diverted from us to have it they're now taking water sources and implementing certain things like fluoride in it 
which affects our consciousness and our health. I mean, even just on a uh, microorganism level and the vi- viruses being found in the water and the pharmaceuticals. And so it to me, it makes me irate that there is this like there's this ancient aqueduct system. There's this, the ancient water that's completely healing to us. That's just abundant, but the word cut off from. So we need to literally figure out a way. But the ocean, the fact that we it's what about to be 2024 in a few hours and um, we, we haven't taken we don't have a ocean like where we take ocean water and and and, and, and make that well, drinkable there's... like it, it just rawr, I just want to it just that those I get pretty passionate about. Yeah, because especially it's insane because you're in California, right? So there's. Like, well, I remember when I wrote my op-ed in 2000, California wanted to take water from the Great Lakes through a pipeline, you know. And I just watched a um, documentary on our state um, public uh, TV channel called Fresh Water, and it was all about Lake Superior because Lake Superior holds 10% of the world's fresh water. And it was like, we got to protect Lake Superior fresh water. It's like I was writing about that. I had that op-ed post 25 years ago, 24 24 years ago. Anyway, so, but yeah, Norway just came out with this new technology for ocean um, desalination where they use uh, like the reverse osmosis, but they use the pressure difference. So they put something way deep in the ocean where the pressure is really, really strong. And then they use that pressure as a pump. And so as they pull it up, it actually pumps out the salt water through the osmosis. Um, so it doesn't require like a huge amount of electricity to achieve the reverse osmosis. And then by the time the water gets up to the surface, the surface to get put it back on the ship, then there's no salt in the water anymore. Mm. But the problem is, it's like, well, how do you scale that up? You know, they're like, well, we, you know, we have the technology. You just have to <laughs> hire us. You have to hire us and we'll, we'll put our ship, we'll put our ship outside your city and we'll provide you with fresh water. You know, you from your um, I made a meme this year that basically brought of talking about over the past 11 uh over the past year okay 11 billion gallons of water has been wasted and released from the hodges reservoir down in san diego and the city of san diego said it is under a state order to keep the water level low in the lake it's getting orders to do that so that to me is absolutely crazy well all I know is, I mean, there's books about, there's books and movies about the corruption of water in California, right? There's, it's like the whole, like, but they, you know, like water is gold, right? Water is going to be more valuable. And that was more. Yeah, well, the water wars too, you know, that's, that you're going to be seeing that implemented. And my friend, um, he is a patent attorney and he was telling me about this case, this judge that oversees all of the Every water case in the country is this one judge. He's at a Sacramento, a Sacramento or Fresno, and he oversees every single case. And just the fact that there's water like disagreements of 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 people like when I'm not, I guess I shouldn't get into it because like when they put in the water and then when it rains and then how they have rights because of this yes. it's ridiculous. But um, well, my yeah, dad, so my dad uh, was a lawyer and he was buddies with federal judges and all that so i i'm i'm well familiar with <laughs> the legal legal shenanigans <laughs> so yeah there um yeah but but that's what i was writing about you know 25 years ago the water crisis will happen in 25 years so you've got a year left and then i worked for clean water action for 10 years so that was basically like my career job I was literally a paper shuffler. That's what I did. And um, anyway, yeah. But there, but then you have this fourth state of water, which you probably know about, like the the um, easy waters, what they call it. You know, like Gerald Pollock. He was he, he was one of the discoverers of this. But essentially, the collagen in your body, when it's under great pressure, when you do these standing exercises, it splits with the water. So you split the water into hydrogen and and. You split the protons and the electrons, and when you do that, you create the virtual photons. You create this um, negative frequency and time time reverse energy from the future by splitting the water, creating this fourth phase of water in your body. And that's and um, Dr. Maiwan Ho, 
she uh, was a Taoist uh, biologist researcher, and she she wrote that that's the secret of the merid the meridian energy in the body is spice when the water, water gets split. This fourth phase of water that they never figured out because water is actually it's not H two O it's actually H one point five O because it's a quantum macro molecule. And the reason is is that like when you have ice, it's very strange for something when it freezes to actually get more crystalline in mm. structure. And so the thing is is that it, they call that that's negative entropy right there is that it expands in volume and it gets more ordered. It gets more orderly, so it's actually negative entropy because it's a quantum, it's a macro quantum molecule, the water. And so, they found that this easy water exists naturally, right at glaciers, right when the water isn't freezing anymore, right when it turns from freezing. Hmm. When the, the the there's a huge electrical, there's a huge energy change. Uh, the heat, the heat point. This is what's happening in in, in the Arctic right now, is that. You have all this ice in the Arctic. Well, the multi-year ice in the Arctic is almost all gone. It's over 90% gone, the multi-year ice. And so the ice, the Arctic is the world's, it's the Earth's air condition. So as soon as you lose the ice, that's... Or it's the ultimate camouflage, Drew. <laughs> or it's like to camouflage some things, you know? Like strategically, like if you're able to modify the weather, like, hey, wait a second, like... It's a lot of power there, and what would your intention to make a place iced over be for? And what what types of things would you be needing to keep cool? Um, the, the the Arctic's the, the, the ice ages are eight hundred thousand years old. The cycles of the ice ages, but the I was just corresponding with uh, Kurt Cuffey, Professor Kurt Cuffey. He's in California, and his he he's a paleoclimatologist. He studied the ice cores. So he sent me a long email about that to study the Greenland, Greenland ice cores. But the world's largest ocean shelf is in the Arctic. It's called the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. And there's um, 1,200 gigatons <clears throat> of pressurized methane in the mm. world's largest ocean shelf. And there's a, there's these scientists that have been studying it, but it doesn't get in the news at all. So essentially, as, that, as the ice disappears, the, the ocean water is now so hot that the ice is melting from below. And that the pressurized methane is called methane hydrates. So it's frozen methane, but it's melting really fast. Since it's pressurized, it immediately shoots up into the atmosphere. And then methane's weight, weight much, much stronger um, a emitter and absorber of photons of the infrared radiation. Mm. So if there's just a five gigaton or I think it's, yeah, it's five gigatons or like that, you just figured out what the oh my god particle is. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Well, <laughs> we they've they've already documented that the methane is accelerating out of the world's largest ocean shelf. And so that could easily double global warming just like that, like in a like in a fear period of few months. It's called an a, an abrupt eruption. Hmm. Uh, I wonder was, measuring that between cows, like what the difference in the numbers would be. Oh, there's not there's there's absolutely no conspiracy comparison because when you have when you have 1200 gigatons a gigaton is a billion tons and it's pressurized so it's all you need is you will instantly double global warming on earth if you just have a 50 um, gigaton release of methane and it could happen at any time in the and because the multi-year ice in the arctic is pretty much all gone already and there's already 500 extra zettajoules of heat that's accumulated in the ocean since 1995 and that heat will eventually be emitted into the atmosphere and so all the all the global warming increase since humans started agriculture has only been 30 30 zettajoules but we've been emitting uh, co2 at 100 times faster than the natural rate which is 12 gigatons per 200 years and so now we will if once those 500 zettajoules get emitted, we're, we will have human extinction at when there's a 4 degrees Celsius increase on the planet. So we're already seeing drought and famine spreading. Like in the Horn of Africa, they had drought the last eight rainy seasons. They had seven of them were drought. So last year, they had over 20 million people in food emergency crisis. 
in the Horn of Africa. Of course, it didn't get hardly mentioned in the news because it's the Horn of Africa, so who cares, right? And but the UN just came out saying, well, this year, 2024, it's going to be twice as many people in food emergency. Because of uh, Mr. Obvious in the chat, he said. Uh taking seawater and then you desalinize it so it's drinkable you can dilute seawater with distilled water and shoot it right in your veins they used to when they didn't have plasma around <laughs> you, you thank you mr obvious <laughs> uh, well yeah, they, 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 if they can desalinize it they will because you know like israel they're relying on desalinization you know it's, if somebody can figure out how to do it in a better How about situation. we uh, defluoride our uh, uh, water that we got right now? <laughs> well, yeah, I Drew. I don't, drink, I don't drink fluoride water because I get I get well water. Well, shoot, dude. Some of like there's people you go to take a shower. You know, your bot, your largest organ is your skin and you're yeah. absorbing that. And so filters um, very important. And yeah, I so use, I avoid <laughs> fluoride. I don't use fluoride toothpaste. I don't use fluoride water. You know, if you want to levitate, don't use fluoride. <laughs> that's, that that's, will definitely be, affect that's your the final message. Or your sure. levitate. That's what we learned here today. That's what I'm going to retitle the name of this video. If you want to levitate, stay away from fluoride. Well, Drew, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. We're coming up on the two hour. There's so much to talk about. Um, rant, Julia. What? Thanks for letting me rant. Oh, you could. You have a safe place here to rant your wisdom. <laughs> this is amazing information. Yeah, and here's my 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 book. In case anybody wants to buy a book, it's on Lulu. <laughs> you got to have a book, right? You know, you got to plug a book. Absolutely. What is it called, Drew? Um, there is no spoon. There is no spoon. Yeah, it's about Catchy. The, matrix, the Matrix conspiracy. And, and what else does it say? Wait, read, yeah, read the whole thing. Uh, the Mi Matrix Conspiracy of Andrea Kuharic, Music, Mass Mind Control, and Anti-Gravity Force. Beautiful. And where can they order it? It's on Lulu. You know, Lulu. It's a it's like an independent book publishing where they print print on demand. You know, so you order it, and then they print it and mail it to you. And you can see it's got lots of photos because people like photos. But there's got to be some more photos. There's color photos. You can get it color. All right, see? Pyramids. Lots of photos in it. <laughs> You're like, you visual, you Westerner, you and your visualizations. <laughs> well, well, yeah, actually, it's got music theory, too. A lot of music theory. Um, yeah, like, because if you train in music from before age nine, it significantly increases your corpus callosum which integrates the left and right brain. Which, which is sad like, that they've taken that out of, like, so many schools, right? Anything that can help, like horticulture, um, music, it's been removed for the future of this Yeah, like, I mean, how many, people, how many kids want to practice, you know, piano for an hour every day when they should be out running around with their friends? But I don't know what kids do these days. Dude, if you take a look at this curriculum that's being taught, it's like really shoved down our faces of like, we're not here. Like, we are here to dumb you down. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, my first year of college, they had no grades. That's where I took uh, Herbert J. Bernstein. He was my quantum physics professor. And he designed the quantum teleportation satellite system for NASA. His, his research got classified top secret without him knowing it. And then he got contacted by the NSA, and then and you can look him up. He's, he designed the quantum teleportation satellite system, and it's all based on non conductivity He uses a donut. Um, you know, he calls it a donut. But that's what it is. It's a the non commutative donut. It's like a toroid that twists around. You know, and that's the secret of quantum teleportation satellite signals. So that was my first year of college. There's no grades. You know, so. You just gave me the middle finger. Nope. Uh-uh. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Doing no. The, sign. The, sign. <laughs> the sign. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the I did that. Tells. That's how I feel about your professor. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He sounds great. He the sounds... Uh... Episode. Oh, you never saw that Seinfeld episode where George is like, did you see that? Did you see what she just did? 
it's the waitress is like the, the, I don't know. you don't it's good you don't watch Seinfeld I never watched Seinfeld when I, when I was actually <laughs> <laughs> well it is a pleasure to have you and um happy new year everyone thank you for being here anytime yeah. Mr. Obvious wants to say anything I just like reading his his uh whatever he's saying because it's it's like, oh, thanks, Mr. Obvious. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. <laughs> the sarcasm's built in. Yes, I love it. it right amazing. on, Mr. Obvious. <laughs> yeah. All right, you guys have a great time. I hope to see you soon. And yeah, take care. Falling stars, the miracles, dancing on the ground. And we'll ride with you to feel it strikes deep down. We'll ride with you. And we'll ride with you to feel it strikes deep down. Suffering grows, yeah. Let's say that life is beautiful.